between the wisdom passed down by ancient healing traditions, anecdotal experience, and modern clinical trials, one thing is clear. Mushrooms are medicinal powerhouses. And I finally found a brand, a product, a company that I feel really aligns with all of my research and understanding when it comes to the medicinal properties of mushrooms, and that is alchemy mushrooms. They grow their mushrooms in California on organic mushroom farms. They keep the whole mushroom in their supplements, and they actually blend mycelium and fruit body in their mushroom powders and capsules to give you the best of both worlds. You can learn more at Alchemy Mushrooms. That's A-L-C-H-E-M-I, alchemymushrooms.com. Use the discount code MUSHROOMHOUR for 20% off your order. Alchemy with an I, mushrooms.com. Hi there, welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're joined by the illustrious lichen expert, Matthew Nelson, PhD. Matthew is a research scientist at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Matt's research began in botany, ecology, and environmental science, and has more recently gravitated towards the evolution of symbiotic associations and the evolution of eukaryotic microbes, fungi and algae, and the roles they have played in shaping terrestrial ecosystems and nutrient cycling over geologic timescales. Both avenues of his research attempt to link diverse fields and organismal groups. He has also conducted work addressing the timing and evolutionary consequences of ant-plant interactions. I'm excited to learn more about symbioses and how fungal organisms play a role in some really groundbreaking symbiotic organisms. Matt, thank you so much for joining us on the Mushroom Hour. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, definitely a pleasure to have you on. Lichen or something I think is now rising in our collective consciousness. We understand what a unique organism it is, this unique symbiosis of fungi and algae. So I'm excited to get someone who knows so much about these enigmatic organisms. But before we take a deep dive into your work, tell us a little bit about how you were drawn to the lichen. You know, did it start with algae? Did it start with fungi? Somewhere else entirely? But but how did you become such a, a lichen expert? It's a great question because it's a rather unusual thing in the kind of scheme of society for someone to specialize on something like this. I, I guess for me, it kind of started as a a kid, I was interested in nature, but then it was more interested in collecting butterflies in the field next door. I started getting into botany a little bit more, um, working at a landscaping company, and then in college, I started to really get more interested in botany after taking some courses. And around that time, during my first botany class, there was actually a National Geographic special on lichens, and we just covered them in my intro botany class, and it was just I remember thinking, these things are really fascinating and seeing these pictures just really brought them to life. There are this couple, Steve and Sylvia Sharanoff, who just took these amazing close-up images. And I was like, huh, those are pretty cool. A few years went by and I took a course on fungi. Um, I took a mycology course and that really piqued my interest then. Um, everything about fungi just kind of like blew my mind. They just kind of didn't seem to really follow the rules. We got to lichens and they were, my interests were kind of coming back that had been stirred up a long time ago. And uh, my professor was an expert on lichen evolution and I had to do a senior project and decided, all right, let's do something on lichens. And the more I learned about them, the more interested I got. And it just kind of kept going from there. I've been extremely fortunate and been given a lot of opportunities to continue pursuing what I'm, I'm so interested in and passionate about. And it's yeah, one of those things that just kind of keeps going. <laughs> I just love hearing the stories of how people find an organism that they get passionate about and there's infinite amounts of discovery, right? It's a whole slew of different organisms. I mean, thousands and thousands of different species. So there's plenty to just constantly be learning. And we're talking about, in your case, lichen, which is two organisms in one. So we've talked a lot about fungi on the show, you know, their basic physiology, their lifestyle. What I was hoping we could do to also lay some of this foundation was talk a little bit about algae, kind of what they are, what makes them unique, you know, some of that basic biology and yeah, just give us that foundation in what we're dealing with when we talk about algae. Sure. 
algae are, uh, you can kind of think of them almost in a, a way as like little plants, essentially. They're still, they photosynthesize, so they're able to make sugars using, you know, using the air, water, and sunlight. And they're actually not all aquatic. So that was kind of my first big kind of surprise. I tend to think of them as being like seaweeds and things like that, thing, you know, pond scum. But it turns right. out there's a number of algal groups that have evolved the ability to live on land in conditions that sometimes are somewhat moist or will have water films kind of going across them or will receive daily doses of fog that they're able to use as water. And those are some of the ones that these lichen fungi have forged partnerships with. And so the idea there is that um, it's kind of similar to what we see with mycorrhizal fungi in a sense. Basically what's going on is that the algae are making the food and they're then feeding the heterotrophic fungus is eating that food, some of that food. So the fungi aren't, a, you know, differ from plants in that they're not able to make their own food. And so they need to get it either by eating dead things or getting it from living things. And this is one way that they do that. And in return, what they're doing is they're basically forming this structure um, that we call a thallus. Some people kind of think of it if you anthropomorphize it quite a bit, almost as like a little bit of a greenhouse for these algae. So it's the thought is, is that it's sort of this environment that's slightly more conducive or a bit more conducive for growing. The thallus itself might be able to kind of maintain moisture conditions um, at a level that the algae would prefer for photosynthesis. The fungi can also kind of modulate the light conditions for the algae inside there so that those there's a layer of hyphae or filaments kind of going over the top of the lichen formed by the fungal tissue, made, made of fungal tissue. And that can intercept some of the light. And some of these uh, lichen fungi also make chemical compounds in the upper surface. And in many cases, we don't really know what the function is for many of these compounds. But in some cases, it seems like they actually will filter out some of the UV radiation so we kind of jokingly refer to them as sunscreen for algae. So they kind right. of allow the lichen to live in a, a real sunny environment, like out on a rock in the middle of a field where they might not be able to on their, their own. So then fungi are basically forming this protective sheath around the algae that ends up functioning like a little photosynthetic battery. And that's at the heart of the symbiosis that is lichen. Now, the question that comes out of this is, Who's making that decision? Is this something mutual? Who initiates the formation of our little greenhouse and our battery system? I mean, how, how is that mediated? Yeah, that, I think that's one of the, the big questions right now is trying to understand who's sort of in charge. And I think traditionally the thought has sort of been that the, the fungus is the one doing the selecting for the algae, but it's not 100% clear to me that that is actually the case. We don't really have a clear understanding right now of what makes some algae compatible with certain fungi. So what happens is that these fungi and algae each have specific ranges of partners they can successfully form a lichen with. And so there's been previous work done by others where they have taken a, a lichen fungus and tried to isolate it and then try to put it back together with a whole number of different algae. And they'll find that in some cases, they do seem to form this kind of stable association. But in other cases, the fungus will just parasitize and kill off the algae. So it's not just any type of algae. It's special ones, certain ones that are able to do that. So there's some kind of host specificity, or I don't know if you'd even call it yep. a host, but yeah, that kind of compatibility we're talking about. And then, you know, so that's one of the big questions is, Who's in charge? How is this relationship getting getting mediated? And then I really like the storyline that, you know, when plants first emerged from the oceans onto land, it was really lichen that kind of pioneered, you know, these early algae partnering with fungi that kind of pioneered later plant species and mycorrhizal relationships that would become critical for plants to make a living outside of this aqueous nutrient mix. And I know you've done work in the evolutionary biology. We're talking about across geologic timescales here. Is that roughly the picture of how this evolved? Or, or what do we know about the evolutionary history of lichen? So that that is, uh, I would say, the kind of traditional idea that prior to the emergence of, of plants, uh, there were lichens on land. 
that were helping to kind of break down the rock through this process called weathering, um, where basically they're kind of breaking it down. And that can have influences on carbon cycling, for instance. So there's been some very old, like for instance, climate disruptions, like for instance, in the Ordovician, or even like over 700 million years ago that have been attributed to whatever was growing on land at that time, including lichens because they were weathering the substrates and that would alter the carbon cycle and lead to changes in temperature. But what we have actually found based on our research is that that isn't really the case at all. We tried to say, well, what evidence is there that there were lichens around before plants? And there wasn't really any great evidence from the fossil data. There were a couple things that sort of looked lichen-like, but there were some strange things about them in our opinion, like they, we're living in water, which isn't something modern lichens really do. And so we decided to take a different approach where we tried to infer an evolutionary tree, basically kind of like a family tree, um, illustrating the relationships of different fungi to one another. And we were able to put that in a temporal perspective. So we we're able to say, well, we know that splits between some of these groups are X many hundred million years old based on fossils we can kind of confidently assign to those, those branching points. Like we might know this group of fungi is at least this many million years old. And so we could utilize that information to kind of put this in a temporal perspective. And then we used a process called ancestral state reconstruction, which is basically a statistical technique where we try to kind of look at um, that family tree and look at the distribution of traits and then try to infer whether that trait was present or absent at all the internal kind of branching points in that family tree. So in our case, we looked at whether something was lichenized or not lichenized. And then we can kind of, because we have this time scaled evolutionary family tree, we can then try to infer what is the oldest kind of node there that was uh, lichen forming. And we were finding that they all seem to post-state, basically in all cases, they would post-state the, the origin of vascular plants. So we were saying, people are saying this, but we're really not seeing any evidence for this at all. And instead, what we're thinking is that the vascular plants were on land at that point, and then the lichens came in afterwards. So kind of flipping that around. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. That might be the bombshell of the episode. You know, in your research, piecing together this evolutionary history, finding evidence that vascular plants were already on land when algae paired up with fungus and crawled out of the ocean. I mean, that's the story that I've always heard and what was kind of deeply ingrained in my memory. So if you're saying vascular plants are already on land, that's a huge shift. Yeah, that's an absolute bombshell. And, you know, and now... I'm thinking of how, uh, of just what it must be like to be working in such vast timescales and ancient timescales. I mean, you're assigning things over 700 million years. I know this is kind of a broad question, but what is it like working in those timescales? Because I talk to a lot of scientists who maybe establish phylogenetic trees using species that are available to them now and starting to put together an idea of kind of modern day biodiversity. But what's that like in trying to pull together family trees and work in such ancient, ancient kind of big time type time scales? It can be very challenging. Like I, I find it very exciting, but it can also be very challenging because ideally we would be able to turn to a really rich, well annotated fossil record. So in many other groups of organisms, that's kind of the the go to. Right. And with fungi. If we want to think about what was going on in the past, there absolutely are lots of fungal fossils, but in many cases it can be difficult to assign them to specific modern groups or difficult to understand what exactly they were doing. And so the way I think is one of the best ways to try to address these questions is to try to use techniques like this. And I think comparative genomics is another really exciting avenue that will really allow us to get at some of these questions, trying to look at when did some of the genes responsible for these different traits actually evolve. I, th I think that's really going to be a very fruitful avenue for our, our understanding of 
how fungi unfolded over time. Enigmatic enough in the present day, much less reaching back millions of years. So just insanely interesting stuff. And then lichens, if they did not kind of predate vascular plants, what do we know then about you know, how they ended up diversifying and really how they started finding their niches? I know you talked about that weathering process. Is that kind of the only niche they fill? Have they expanded into other ecological niches? Or what does that picture look like? Sure. So it's quite, quite fascinating in my opinion. Um, there's a number of, of really interesting things about them. So, so first off, if we look on the fungal side of things, the ability to form lichens has evolved multiple times. This isn't just a one-time sort of thing. And so that in itself, I find really fascinating. Similarly, we can see that like with ectomycorrhizae, the ability to do that has evolved multiple times as well. So we can see this kind of popping up at many different points in time across many different parts of the, the phylogenetic tree. So we can, most of them are confined to the ascomycota, but there are a handful of basidiomycete fungi that also form lichens. But yeah, your question then of like, are they all just still sticking around on rocks or what's going on is a very right. good question. So they've kind of diversified to occupy all biomes across the world and all continents. So we even see them in Antarctica now, like some of the most extreme habitats, um, you can find them there. I actually, just prior to COVID, was on a collecting trip with some colleagues in the Atacama Desert, where we are in an area where it basically rains once every 20 years, but there's fog coming in off the Pacific every day. And there's some lichen communities there that are able to intercept this fog and use that as a daily dose of water. <laughs> so that was really fascinating. But yeah, so as many of them still will grow on rocks and soil. We also get them growing on plants, um, generally on tree bark. Occasionally, uh, like in the tropics, you actually you'll get them growing on leaves. So in the tropics, it's quite interesting where you have these kind of long-lived leaves there. You'll see lichens and mosses and cyanobacteria and things like that growing on, on these leaves that are very tiny generally, but there's actually quite a lot there. So yeah, they've been able to kind of diversify. We tend to see, there's been some debates about whether they follow the traditional latitudinal diversity gradient. This is an idea that, this is a trend seen in many other different groups of, of organisms where the, the tropics seem to be the most kind of diverse diverse parts of the world for this group of organisms, for instance, birds, mammals, we see as you get near the poles, diversity kind of peters out basically or decreases. And there's been some questions about whether the reverse might be true, whether we see like an inverse latitudinal diversity gradient. And I guess what I think is going on is that a lot of the larger, more kind of conspicuous lichens become very abundant and dominant in habitats where many of these plants start to kind of taper peter out so like when you start when you go to like tundra habitats in alaska you see lots and lots of lichens there as well but the tropics actually holds quite a lot and i've seen the work that um, a number of researchers have done over time has really kind of illustrated that there's been a lot of overlooked diversity there in the tropics as with many other groups but also just many of these lichens are a lot more subtle they're small little crusts living on, on tree bark, and they just don't jump out at, at you as much. And so I think there's been more and more work now into those. And I suspect we'll start seeing something that might be a bit more akin to that. There's uh, a colleague who has done work for uh, her PhD thesis actually on this topic, and I'm eager to see more of her results. So yeah. That's really interesting because you do have this mental image of, you know, kind of a blasted cold, maybe high elevation landscape with rocks covered in lichen. And that when I think lichen, that's what I see. So it's interesting to think they might be living on little leaves in the tropics or on tree bark and just to flesh out this picture of what lichens are. But when we're talking about speciation and this, I mean, this example of convergent evolution where multiple different species have come to this same capacity, which yeah, is always insanely interesting. How are we even differentiating species? Because really, this is a combination of a fungi species and an algal species. So how do we get a species of lichen? How does this work? It's a great question. So 
if someone points at a ligand and says, this is, you know, for instance, Physia milligrana, that name actually refers to the fungus. And what generally happens is that fungus is able to form a lichen with a pool of algae that we were kind of talking about before. There's a, a range of algae that might be compatible that it's able to associate with. And if it is with a compatible partner, it will differentiate and make this totally new kind of phenotype or growth form, which is what we see as the lichen, which is different from what the fungus makes if it's on its own on a Petri plate which is something else that's really fascinating about them. There's some cool pictures you can find of some of these things like a Xanthoria parietina that makes this big orange kind of sunbursty looking lichen. And when it's by itself, when the fungus is by itself on a Petri plate, it just kind of looks like a blob, nothing very <laughs> exciting. But when compatible partners meet, the fungus differentiates and produces this entirely new kind of growth form, different from what it does on its own. So anyway, what, where I was going with this is that in nearly all cases, if the fungus is partnered with a compatible algal partner, it will always make the same kind of growth form, the same sort of phenotype. And so when we see it, the name is generally, will refer to the fungus, even though it's associating with an alga that has its own name, and it could be, you know, one of any, you know, three different algae, but it's making that kind of same phenotype. And so that's that's how it's how it's worked traditionally. And there's some some exceptions to this rule, but that's generally how it has worked. And so in terms of what characters people have used to kind of separate things into different species, it's I would say similar to a lot of other areas of mycology where people are focusing on reproductive structures. So with crusts, so some of these lichens don't really some of these lichens make this growth form that's kind of like plastered on to the tree bark or the leaves or the soil, and they're not all that showy. Mm. They look like crusts, as their name would imply. And in those cases, what identification is typically based on looking at spore characteristics, and things like that. So sectioning the fruiting body and looking at number of spores, number of uh, septa or cross walls within the spores, um, Ascus characters, things of that nature. With the um, kind of larger lichens, like the, the folios, kind of leaf-like lichens, or fruticose, which are like these tufted lichens that might be hanging down from trees or growing up from the soil. There's more characters there that people will tend to use. Um, looking, for instance, at hairs on the underside of the lichen uh, phallus, different traits related to kind of lobe width, things like that. But then chemistry is also something that has played an important role in, in separating species and lichen fungi. So the fungi make a, these lichen fungi make a range of chemical compounds, over a thousand different types of chemical compounds. Many of these are only known to, to lichen forming fungi. And people will sometimes use those to separate species. So two things might look exactly identical, but they differ in their presence or absence of a different chemical substance. And there's been a lot of debate over the years about whether that's a really a good thing to be using or is that just something like eye color or hair color, you know, is this just a polymorphism within a species that we're seeing or is this a fixed kind of genetic difference that reflects species boundaries? So that's been kind of a contentious area. Similarly, some of these lichens uh, will regularly produce apothecia, so like the fungal fruiting body. Um, that's the result of sexual reproduction. But oftentimes you can also find species that look very similar to them, but they very rarely make those. And instead they make these vegetative propagules where the fungus and algae will co-disperse together. And so people, had, there's been a lot of debates over time about whether these are the same species or are they sister species like most closely related in one another and it turns out in many cases the situation is a, a bit more complicated <laughs> and that's a area of, of um, active work that a lot of people are, are continuing to work on trying to um, understand the kind of species boundaries and this like the advances and technological advances uh, are allowing us to go much deeper now than we were 
able to 20 years ago. Now we're able to kind of look at genome level data to try to look at gene flow. Instead of looking at a single gene or a handful of genes, we're able to go much, much deeper to try to understand those boundaries better. As you were just delineating how you identify species, so many questions start popping into my head, and I'm sure these are areas that people are actively researching. But you know, one big one is when it comes to reproduction, you just reference reproductive structures. You know, is it the fungi reproduces, you know, a new fungal organism, and then that has to find its own algae? Does it take some algae from the mother lichen? How does that work? That's an awesome question. Yeah, so it it varies, kind of varies by fungal species. So in basically all cases, you could um, make a new lichen from that parent through fragmentation. So like if you've got a lichen and you break off a lobe, that lobe would be able to survive on its own somewhere else given the right conditions. So in that case, it would be this clone, you know, identical clone of the parent. But as you said, there's some some of these fungi have evolved the ability to kind of make specialized structures in which they carry their algal partners with. And so there's a couple different types of that. There's something called ceridia, which is kind of like a, it looks like powder on the lobes of a, a lichen. And what it is, is it's like a few algal cells with some fungal filaments or hyphae kind of wrapped around it. And those can get dispersed away so it might be like some wind or water or insects, something like that. We'll move it away and that will be a genetic identical clone of the parent Dallas. Another way is kind of something similar. Instead, they look like little tiny fingers that stick up. And again, that's a clonal form of reproduction. And the advantages of that are that both partners are there. The lichen can just get start can germinate and get going, <laughs> get going with your right. life and start growing. And, you know, if you don't go very far, it might be that perhaps that combination, that combination of that fungus and that alga, those individual genotypes, that combination might be beneficial in that particular area. Since the parent was able to persist there, it might be a good thing. But there's also kind of a downside in that if everyone around you is all identical genetically, that could be kind of a problem if there's something like climate change or you're in a forest and something gets cut down or a tree falls and suddenly you're exposed to light. It might be more difficult to persist in the face of some of these perturbations when there's no diversity there. On the flip side though is what you were saying where the fungus produces apothecia or parathesia. And in, those, in nearly all cases, the fungus will release its meiotically derived spores on its own and they need to find an algal partner. And there you get the benefits of having that sexual reproduction where you get genetic recombination, but there's this kind of tricky step now of how do you find your algal partner? Right. And that is kind of a black box. There's a lot of really interesting work that's gone into that, but we have a, a long ways to go yet. So for instance, the, yeah, the question is how, how do they find these? And one thought is that these algae just are kind of blowing around and hopefully the right partner comes along. And algae drops into your life, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You can think about how like with this reproductive strategy, it might be beneficial if there's a low chance of finding a suitable partner, it might be good to make a lot of spores in that case with the hopes that at least some will be successful. So there's kind of interesting questions you can think about in that context. But then there's also been some suggestions that, well, perhaps they can associate with an alga that they aren't really truly compatible with. Like it's something they can kind of have as a temporary or I had a, a friend refer to them as a starter alga that they can kind of parasitize for a while and at least get some nutrition. And hopefully the appropriate one will, will come along at some point. But then there's been some other work that's I just found incredibly fascinating. It's been called kleptobiosis, was one of the fancy names mm. someone gave, gave it. And the idea is that these fungi steal algae from another lichen. Okay, klepto, I get it now. <laughs> yeah, it took me a second too. And I'm like, ah, yeah. But um, yeah, it was some really fascinating work that had been done 
where they were finding that they would oftentimes see this, this lichen that is very common. It's in the genus Physia. It's something that a lot of people in kind of Europe, North America have likely seen before. It's kind of a grayish, bluish sort of color. And they were finding that it often co-occurred with this species of Xanthoria, which makes these bright orange kind of leafy phalli. And the orange one, the Xanthoria, disperse, uh, would disperse, it would produce apothecia. So the spores would, fungal spores would disperse independently and needed to find an algal partner. And what they had actually found was that it was germinating near the fissia, near that kind of grayish blue-gray lichen, and started to grow into it. And they started to see that the apothecia, the normally kind of darkish apothecia of that lichen started to turn orange. And they were like, oh man, <laughs> oh my. I think what, and so what they uh, were suggesting then was that, yeah, this uh, orange xanthoria was kind of growing into it and taking over or taking the algae. And there's been some other examples too of, uh, for instance, uh, Cladonia is something that a lot of people might be familiar with, something like the British soldier lichen. Another type is a reindeer moss, which is actually a lichen. But oh, wow. they were finding that there's a crusty lichen that would grow over it and actually the, the fungus by itself would grow over it, steal its algae. And then they found that actually later in its life would switch to a different algal partner. So it was something where like, it starts with one type of alga for a while and eventually would transition to a different type. So it's a very fascinating area of research. I, I feel um, trying to understand what's going on at, at this stage, but it's extremely, it can be very, very difficult to study because it can be quite challenging to, to culture these fungi, for instance, so it can be very difficult to do experimental manipulations on them. That would be really nice. Some work to kind of get around this that's been really fascinating, I think, is setting out microscope slides or cover slips in an area and just leaving them out there for a year and looking at what colonizes them and then looking at that under the microscope and starting to see spores germinate and grow towards algae. So we're getting a kind of a better insight into what goes on there, but it can be very challenging because you're having to ID the fungus by the spores at that point. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's quite interesting. I mean, this is the hidden life of lichen, the fact that they're stealing from each other. It doesn't sound like necessarily parasitizing, but actually stealing the algae from the other lichen. Now, can these fungi survive without their algal partners? I mean, might we have seen, especially the ascomycota, I guess we wouldn't see, but do these things exist on their own in the environment and kind of put up some other latent ability, which fungi are known to do? They'll maybe be saprobic for a little bit and survive or yeah, find some other partner that's not perfect. Do the fungi have that capacity as well? So even if they've gotten their algae stolen, they can still survive a little bit? I, th I think that's one of the really interesting questions right now. Um, so traditionally, the, the idea has been that they're ecologically obligate. So the idea is that we really only see them out in nature in the lichenized form, but we know that we are able to take some of them back to the lab and grow them in the absence of their algal partners. So grow them on a Petri plate with appropriate auger and media and such. So they're able to, to live without their algal partner. But the question is, yeah, could they actually do that in nature or not? Would they be outcompeted? Do they still have the genes to uh, do this, et cetera? So there's a, I think that's a really exciting area of, research that we're hopefully going to learn a lot about in the future. Well, and another exciting part of this too, is you were talking about the chemicals that are produced and how when it comes to differentiating lichen species, a lot of it does come down to the, the chemicals they're producing. And I had questions about what chemicals are being made for them to perform that ecological role of weathering. I mean, we know that fungi produce incredible enzymes, ligninolytic enzymes to break down complex carbon structures in wood, but we're talking rock. I mean, what kind of chemicals are they producing? And then to add to this kind of idea that the algal fungi combination is maybe imbuing something special, can these fungi produce those same enzymes without the algae or do, or do we know that? Sure. Uh, so the first, the first question, what chemicals are they making to break down the 
contribute to the, the weathering process. Oxalic acid is something that a lot of them make, and that isn't something that's restricted to lichen fungi. There's other fungi yeah. that make that as well. But yeah, so they're able to use, some of them will um, use chemicals, but then others will actually kind of break down the rock physically. So little filaments or hyphae will kind of go into little cracks and go down further and you start making the cracks larger and larger and bits of rock will flake off and be exposed then. So there's both a chemical and a, a physical process to weathering. And in terms of whether the, the lichen fungi make these chemicals in the absence of algae or not, a lot of them are produced only in the presence of those algae. So there's a lot of really interesting things that seem to go on when the fungus is partnered with a compatible alga. And I think that's also going to be very exciting now to, to see the genomic work that really starts to understand what genes are upregulated and downregulated during this transition. When did genes like this evolve that enable them to form a lichen? Have they been lost, et cetera? So I think that's a really exciting area where comparative genomics can really shine a light into this mysterious <laughs> world. Yeah, just the fact that the presence of algae would unlock some latent capacity in the fungi. And like you just referenced, right, when you said it, I was like, of course, that other fungi have the ability to produce oxalic acid. You know, that's one of the hallmarks, even of mycorrhizal fungi, is they're able to break some parts of kind of rock material and bring minerals back to plants. But they don't need an algae to do that. Maybe they need a plant to do that. Maybe there's so many secrets in how these different capacities show themselves, these facultative capacities and why. And it sounds like lichens are another example or showcase of that. And, you know, if we were to classify your work specifically, you've given us kind of the huge broad view of all my questions about the basics of lichen and how this relationship comes together and what's unique about it. But if you were to classify your own work, maybe highlight some of the research you've done. You know, I was reading about some of your recent work, and you'll excuse my pronunciation, Trebuxia. Trebuxia. Trebuxia of Trebuxia. So yeah, if you can classify some of your work and maybe the direction you've taken from reading your Google page, it looks like you've looked at probably too many questions for one podcast, but give us, but give us a little bit of a, a flavor of the research that, that you performed into Lichen. Sure. Yeah, I, I definitely have some broad interests. And uh, I guess that the, the crux of it is I'm especially interested in symbioses and biotic interactions and how they've evolved, diversified over time, and what have been the consequences of, of those uh, symbioses. Yeah, like you said, I've also been very interested in better understanding the algal side of, of things. So when people had traditionally studied lichens, the, the overwhelming majority of lichen researchers focused on the fungal partner. And there were definitely some working with the algae, but it was a, a very small fraction. And that, I think, really, the number of people working on, on lichen algae has really increased over the years. And I think what, what kind of happened around the 2000s was people started sequencing DNA from the algae. They had, they've extracted the, the DNA from the lichen. So they've, when they extract it from the lichen, they've got both the fungal and the algal DNA there. And so they're able to develop primers to target the algae instead of the fungi. And this was really revolutionary because these algae traditionally have been challenging to identify morphologically because a lot of their traits got modified when they are in the lichenized state. And so you would have to isolate them and grow them free living on, in culture. And then you would see some of the reproductive characteristics you need to make an identification. And so that was kind of a time consuming process and sequencing really allowed us to get a window into their, a picture of their diversity much more easily. And we started to see that there's a lot more diversity out there than had traditionally been, been described, as with basically all organisms. It's something where, um, yeah, these are very small <laughs> organisms with maybe a limited sort of morphology. And uh, we're starting to find that, well, there's actually quite a bit of genetic diversity here, and we're probably really underestimating the number of species that are actually out there. Yeah. And when you laid out that example of how entering genetic variability into the equation, it sounds like it's kind of each side independently, you know, fungi produce independent sporulating structures that create sexually recombinate another fungi adds to this element of genetic variation. 
I would imagine the same for algae, right? They would have to do their reproductive cycle. And so is the independent kind of evolution and potential mutations of algae potentially a big player in speciation of lichen? You know, that un that understanding that maybe there's more variability here than we thought. Could that have a much bigger role than we thought in dictating, you know, how fungal species react and then create diversification within lichen if if my wandering train of thought there's even a question i guess no i i totally see what you're what you're what you're asking here so yeah i i, I think there is potential for so one, one of the questions that kind of comes up is whether a switch if the fungus switches to a new algal partner could that elicit speciation essentially and I don't think it's quite that simple, but basically what happens is over, you know, geographic space, you get some isolation and you can ultimately yeah, re get reduced gene flow and get speciation through, through those processes. But what a number of researchers have really made clear over time is that you might have a fungal species that might be very widespread. So one example I'm thinking of is uh, something that was kind of like across a good deal of kind of the Eastern US, for instance. But what they were finding was that that fungus was associating with different types of algae across that range. So down in Florida, it might be with Trabuxia species A most often, but by the time it gets to you know New York, it's with Trabuxia species C instead and really not with A. And so this was suggesting that the, the idea that had come out of all this research is that the fungi might switch to kind of locally compatible algae over their sort of broad geographic range. So Trabuxia A might not do so well in New York. So each of these algae also have their own kind of climatic tolerances and such, and so does the fungus. And so they might not always be perfectly overlapping. So yeah, they, uh, the thought, one of the questions is whether if you are able to disperse very far away, are you able to also perhaps switch to a new kind of locally available alga that might allow you to persist there? And over time, perhaps you'd have separation between these different, between these fungi <laughs> such that you wind up getting new species over a long time. Yeah, so it's it's quite interesting to think about, I think. Well, and I like that idea that you're exploring the algal side of this because in everything we've described, it very much sounds like they're passive players in this symbiosis. They're almost these poor little living batteries that are getting passed around between fungi and hunted by fungi that seek to lichenize them. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of future work illuminating what goes on in that relationship. And I think in general, for everyone listening, you've really animated lichen and made them seem like so much more going on there than just these static things we see on rocks. A another big question that I was struck with in reading your work was what do these lichen tell us about an ecosystem's health? Because obviously you've laid out their big players, they have a defined niche, they've been around a long time, and you also referenced you know, things like climate change, how they might change the landscape of these species. So what does lichen health in an ecosystem tell us about that ecosystem self? Sure. So there's a number of different ways in which lichens will kind of provide different ecosystem services. You can think about how in some habitats, for instance, deserts, you might have a lot of soil blowing around. But if you have a crust of lichens or other kind of fungi and algae growing across that, that would stabilize the soil and prevent all of this from kind of blowing away. So it might help prevent erosion. And you can also think about how, when there's water coming into the system, the presence of those lichens could differentially influence how much water is absorbed or how long the water is actually retained. Um, so this is something that can also be kind of a big deal when we think about lichens growing on trees, especially in areas where we have really dense lichen coverage is that they're really able to absorb a lot of water in the ecosystem that way. Some of the lichens also will contribute to the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen's very important for basically everything. <laughs> uh, everyone needs nitrogen, but it's often found in limiting supplies. And so some of these lichens will actually, instead of associating with eukaryotic green algae, they associate with cyanobacteria or sometimes with both at the same time. 
Um, and those cyanobacteria have the ability to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form that's usable by other organisms. And so they're doing this conversion and the lichen itself is getting that nitrogen, but we can think of when that lichen dies and falls off, lands on the ground, it will be releasing that nitrogen um, and contributing to nitrogen cycling. Similarly, there's carbon that'll be locked up in the lichen thallus, and when that drops down, that will also be released. We're also finding that there, well, there's a few other ways. Uh, one is that some birds will actually use them as nesting material. So I've had hummingbird, I had a friend and colleague who brought me a little hummingbird nest that it had kind of decorated with lichens. And I think the thought is that that, you know, maybe the hummingbird viewed that as some sort of camouflage, something of that, of that nature. Some mammals actually rely on them for food. So like reindeer moss is actually a lichen that Reindeer will, will eat at times. Uh, I think there's elk that will eat or mule deer that will eat some of these, some lichens as well. So there's a number of different mammals that will also, and then there's a lot of small invertebrates that we also see that might use them as little places to nest. So you can think if you've got a lichen on some tree bark, that might make a nice, there's a little, you know, <laughs> space in between the lichen and the tree that might make a nice location uh, to nest. We also yeah. see things like snails and slugs that will graze on the lichen. So sometimes you can see this sort of zigzag across the lichen where it's gone across with its radula and basically like scraped the algae out. So we can see them, yeah, being important for those uh, roles as well. And then it's also just really fascinating because a number of researchers have really highlighted how the lichen itself is actually an ecosystem. And there's a lot more, like the traditional idea has kind of been that it's the lichen fungus and the lichen alga. But what we're finding is that sometimes there's a couple different algae in there. We're also seeing there's a lot of other fungi that are hanging out in there. And in many cases, it's, it's not entirely clear what they're doing. So some of them, one group of researchers, Toby Sprabella and his group found some yeasts that were regularly they're finding quite regularly in, in some of these lichens. Another uh, researcher, Betsy Arnold, she and her team have found more like filamentous fungi living inside there. And the question is, are these sort of like endophytes that are living right. in there or what is what exactly is going on? So there's a lot of other things we're finding that can sometimes be inside these, these lichens that they might themselves serve as kind of a ecosystem to house further diversity. I mean, to, yeah, you made them these active players and now you're laying out that it's actually this whole ecosystem terrain with other different players involved. And I mean, really, really interesting. We don't think of that when we look at the humble lichen, but we're looking at this own microbiome inside these organisms. I mean, absolutely fascinating. And I know a lot of your work too has looked at, you talked about that nitrogen cycling, that carbon cycling. And I would imagine then over these millions of years that some of your work has covered, they must have played a huge role in those cycles and really planetary changes we've seen, right? We're suggesting that they're at least a component of that. So it kind of varies the extent to which they're contributing uh, to different ecosystems. So like in a, a temperate rainforest, they are definitely contributing carbon there, but the fraction of carbon that they're contributing might not be as big as the giant trees around it. But in other <laughs> ecosystems like deserts, they might play a more substantial role. So it really kind of varies. But yeah, we were especially interested in thinking more about nitrogen fixation and what it would mean to have lichens and how they might influence the world around them. Yeah, especially environments, you know, we think of prehistoric environments that may not have had a lot of vegetative or vascular plant life, they may have had a big impact. So an, another interesting perspective I got from looking at your work. And then we talked about, you know, their role in ecosystems, how they are an ecosystem, but then I was reading something you did about air quality. You know, what can lichens tell us about air quality or what what is that relationship? Yeah, so that was kind of where I started originally with lichens, I was especially interested in ecology and thinking about them as, as biomonitors of air quality and forest health. And so basically what, yeah, so uh, what actually we see is that many lichens are negatively impacted by air pollution. And so people will use lichens as a proxy 
for air quality. So instead of setting up some of these uh, more expensive, this expensive equipment to monitor air quality, you might be able to go out and survey a forest and look for the presence or absence of different species and the total diversity and use that information to kind of get some sort of insight into air quality. So for instance, some will respond negatively to nitrogen pollution. So if there's lots of ammonia around, that might negatively impact some while others do very well in those circumstances. Some are extremely sensitive to sulfur dioxide. Many of them actually are. And the, the general trend then that we see is that you tend to have lower diversity with poorer air quality. And so there's a really fascinating study done in part of Italy, I think it was in 1995, and they looked in this particular area and color-coded individual townships or counties, and they looked at what's the kind of mortality due to lung cancer, and then they also said, what's the lichen diversity in that same area? And you see a very striking resemblance between the two. And this is not to suggest that lichens are purifying the air. It was more that these lichens are responding to, negatively responding to some of these pollutants that are actually killing people. They're more canary in the coal mine in that scenario. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, the U.S. Forest Service actually has a whole pro program set up to use lichens as indicators of forest health. So many of them also will be restricted to more like old growth type forests. And so you can kind of use them as a, a proxy again for looking at forest health as well. Yeah, as bio indicators of ecosystem health, I thought that concept was really something I hadn't thought of before again. When I thought lichen, uh, my imagination apparently was pretty limited for what lichen meant. And this, just reading your work, just exploded in my mind what lichen are and and what they tell us. I don't think it's limited at all. I think they're, I mean, yeah, they're something I had not considered very much in depth before I started getting into it. And yeah, I started to learn. Yeah, there's a lot more to it. And yeah, it's just really fascinating in my opinion. Absolutely, and we've run through some pretty big questions about lichen and you know every aspect from like fungi algal relationships and everything like that but for you is there another kind of big burning question when it comes to lichens or in the community of lichenologists i'm, I'm hoping that's a scientific discipline in a word absolutely <laughs> there's actually a journal called the lichenologist the lichenologist so perfect yeah. so for lichenologist community for the lichenologist community out there what are some of the big questions that remain around lichens or maybe the frontiers of research as you see them i guess for me the, the things i'd especially be interested in knowing is yeah more about kind of the genomic underpinnings of of what it means to be a lichen what genes are required for it when did these pop up to what extent are they retaining genes that might allow them to do other things, like the ASAPRO, questions of that, of that nature. I think also trying to really understand what exactly is driving both this selectivity, like what we were talking about, how a fungus might associate with different algae. And that range of algae kind of varies across fungi, where you can have some that are specialists, and some that are generalists that can associate with a broader range. So I think trying to understand what makes something a special, why is something a specialist and why is something a generalist is another one. And then I think also understanding what structures compatibility, like why are certain, <laughs> certain algae and fungi compatible and why not, what's going on kind of at a chemical or biochemical level there. I think those are some of the, the more fascinating ones. And then I, I am also very interested to see more about, uh, so one of, the, one of the things we see with many of these lichen fungi is that they have very broad distributions. Mm -hmm. So some of them you might find in Greenland, but also in Antarctica. And the question then becomes, is this all one species or not? And if so, how are they maintaining gene flow? So I think really starting to get at some of those questions more deeply, looking at genomics, and then if they are maintaining this gene flow, how are they doing it? Is it just regular aerial dispersal? Is it migrating birds? What is what is going on? How are these gametes and, and spores getting from one part of the world to the other? 
and uh, I think those are all going to be really fascinating questions. And in other cases that we've actually seen the opposite, so something that looks like one very widespread species that might be present in Europe, North America, and Australia winds up being a few different things. So yeah, it can go both ways. <laughs> I mean, always a big question with fungi, biogeography, how do they distribute because they're static? I think with mushrooms and kind of fruit body producing fungi, it's a little more clear. But yeah, when we think of lichen, you know, this is something that seems particularly static and slow moving. How are they distributing? Really a, such a big question to look at. So I'm glad that lichen fungi don't break the mold, or it sounds like lichen fungi don't break the mold then when it comes to fungi, which is the biggest questions are some of the most fundamental questions to how yeah. this organism does what it does. Another one that just popped into my head, how old are lichen fungi generally? Because when you see them, you think this thing must be ancient. So how old does one kind of individual, if we can even say lichens have defined individuals, um, you know, how old does one individual get? It can vary quite a bit. So some of the lichens seem to be very short short-lived, like maybe they'll live a couple of years or something like that. So you can also think need to think about it in the context of how stable is the substrate that the lichen's growing on. So if you're growing on a leaf, there's kind of a, a finite <laughs> lifespan of that leaf. It might, you know, in the tropics be there a few or five years or something like that. But when that falls down, that's most likely going to spell the end of that lichen. Whereas something like a a branch might be a little more stable, but you can think again if the light conditions change, that can affect it. But in terms of how old they are, um, yeah, they can be very slow growing, like on the order of millimeters per year. So that means that they can, you know, be tens of years old, some of the lichens we're seeing around us. Some of the oldest ones that have been suggested are more like on the order of like a thousand years or more. And one of the, in, in some cases, those lichens grow on rock and will just kind of keep growing outwards. And the middle part of the lichen will actually erode. But you can see this ring that kind of continues growing outward. There's actually a whole field, kind of a, a discipline called lichenometry, which is basically trying to use lichens to date the age of surfaces. So this is something that has been used especially when people are trying to look at when glaciers retreated or how old artwork is, such as petroglyphs, or you could think of something like Stonehenge, for instance. The idea being that if we can kind of estimate, I'm simplifying it here, but the, the basic idea, if we can estimate the growth rate of the lichen and we know it's, you know, <laughs> we know its size, we can then infer how many years it's at least been there and get some sort of indication that this surface has at least been present and available for colonization for x many years lichenometry that might be the coolest discipline i've ever i hope i get to meet a lichenometrist because <laughs> that's just that's fantastic and you know while i'm just peppering you with random questions from reading your work the final one i have is just you've looked at something that i've kind of heard whispered about theories around coal formation and I've had several people tell me that, oh, yes, coal were formed as these really condensed carbon deposits by ancient wood before fungi developed those enzymes that let them break those complex carbon rings in wood. All the wood just laid there and eventually was buried and turned into coal. And I saw you had written a paper that shows you found evidence that that was not the case. So maybe dispel that, that myth for us a little bit or tell us what you found. Sure. So this was um, a project I did together with uh, Kevin Boyce, who had actually started this, and then I joined up as, as part of it, and we worked together with a couple of other geologists. And yeah, as you said, basically, like, there had been this sort of historic idea that I gained a lot of traction in different communities that essentially said the reason we have so much coal in the Carboniferous was because Fungi that degrade lignin, which is this uh, substance plants make that can be very challenging to, to decompose, that fungi hadn't evolved the ability to break that down yet. And so we made a number of arguments for um, why these massive carboniferous coal deposits were due to other reasons other than a delay in the kind of a fungal ability to break down lignin. And so there's a number of different points we end up making in this paper, but a couple were that first off, the, the plants that tended to be the dominant 
plant element, the, the, the dominant elements of this coal were uh, things called lycopsids. So we still have a handful of lycopsids around today, things like Hooperzia and Lycopodium or Selaginella. But historically, the lycopsids during the Carboniferous made these big trees. And what we were pointing out was that up to 80% of, if you look within some of these coals, you can see up to 80% of it is filled with lycopsid tissue, some of this periderm or bark-like stuff that they, they make. But what some previous work Kevin had actually done showed was that there isn't lignin in here. So this isn't an argument at all about, about lignin. So that was something we were trying to point out that this has nothing to do with lignin and there's a lot of other things that go into actually making coal. Another point we tried to make is that the carbon cycle is actually really sensitive to disruption. And if lignin hadn't been broken down for like a hundred some million years, it would have completely removed all the atmospheric carbon dioxide from the system. And it would have plunged us into this like freezing state that would have been very, very difficult to get out of. So we did a couple of calculations trying to say that like, even if lignin had been produced at a much smaller amount, smaller proportions, even if we went a million years without lignin being broken down, that would totally disrupt the carbon cycle and send it out of, out of whack. So trying to, extrapolating this to 100 million years was, was gonna be very problematic. And another is that there's other organisms that break down lignin as well. So there's other types of fungi, there's also bacteria that do, so something was likely breaking it down. And then, yeah, we got into a few other points, some of which are that following the Permian, so like the Carboniferous, after that ends, we get into the Permian. Following that, much more recently, we see some big periods of coal production as well. So mm -hmm. if it was something to do with the absence of lignin decomposing fungi, well, we still have this period subsequently where these fungi were around, but we're getting huge amounts of coal. And so instead, what we were trying to argue is that it was Carboniferous was this kind of unique time in Earth history where we had a warm, wet tropics. So we have really high productivity there where you could get lots and lots of plants, but there are also lots of wetlands. And so when these uh, plants would fall into this water, they would fall into these kind of anoxic environments that would slow decomposition. And we also would see that the kind of configuration of Pangaea was such that we had a lot of tectonic basins around that would allow for the kind of accumulation of lots of peat, uh, as well as the burial of peat and subsequent kind of prevention of erosion. So that's another thing is that the peat needs to get buried, but then it needs to also stay buried. And if there's lots of erosion, then all the peat might come back up. So we were arguing that we had this kind of unique condition that allowed for high production, burial, and keeping it locked up for a long time, basically. So really on all counts, you guys looked at it, and that's what I thought when I read it. It's pretty thorough. The composition of the coal indicates that, it basically in all aspects here, the composition of the coal, when the coal is appearing, you know, alternative theories, to me, it seemed like a pretty firm answer. And as much as I want fungi to somehow be responsible for everything, I think in this case, there's there's a little more going on. It's a little more complicated. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there because it's something I've heard from mm -hmm. a lot of corners of the yeah. fungi community. And I thought that the work that you and Kevin Boyce put out was really compelling. So I encourage people to read that as well. And that puts me into the perfect place to have you tell us where people can find your work. You know, that paper and all the other papers I've been referencing throughout our talk, where is the best place for people to connect with your work? Probably uh, my webpage, if you just look me up and look up fungi or lichens, that should pop up. And feel free to email me for PDFs. I'm happy to send them to you. Some of them are available online if you search for the titles, but some of them are kind of locked down under copyright and such. So I can't <laughs> distribute them that way. But yeah, I'd say I got my website and I'm happy to send them along. Well, if anyone has had their interest peaked by this conversation. I'm sure pretty much everyone listening has. I really encourage you to go to Matthew Nelson's website and it's N-E-L-S-E-N. -E 
and look up the information, read all about lichens because it will kind of transform how you see this pretty major player and really keystone symbiosis when it comes to so many different fields of science. So many things lead back to lichen and observations from lichen. So it's a really interesting organism to learn more about. So now that we know where people can find your work on lichen, you know, tell us a little bit about the work you did with ant-plant interactions because that's another amazing symbiosis and maybe just a snapshot of what that work has been for you and, and is ongoing for you. Sure. Uh, so this was a really interesting, exciting opportunity I, I had where I uh, had an opportunity to work on a project involving insect plant interactions and their evolution. And I thought this would be a really cool way to get some experience working with something outside of fungi, kind of another type of symbiosis. And perhaps I could, you know, leverage what I learned uh, already and bring new new tools back to what I work on fungi. So I thought this would give me a kind of broader opportunity within which to kind of study biotic interactions. And so one of the, uh, there's a few different projects we worked on, but the the one that we have published so far, we tried to look at when did ants start utilizing plants and when did plants start utilizing ants and how has that influenced the diversification of these interacting lineages? And so what we found actually was that there's, there's well, we know that there's a number of different ways that ants can rely on plants. They can use them for food sources, nesting, hunting grounds to try to find food. And so we tried to kind of look at the order in which those evolved. And what we found was that the earliest ants, this was consistent with previous work, started out on the ground. They nested in the ground, looked for food on the ground, and they were predators. So they were eating other invertebrates. But what we saw then was that they started to eventually uh, start to forage on plants. They started to go up on the plants looking around for food. And eventually they started to change their diet somewhat. They started to utilize plant based food sources, incorporate them into their diet. And then eventually we found some also started nesting in plants as well. So they were relying on plants for all different aspects of their life, for a place to live, food source, place to find food, everything. Um, so we were kind of looking at that kind of stepwise progression. And then we're trying to kind of disentangle it. And then what we also were interested in was trying to look at whether these associations conferred any benefits that might have led to increased speciation, so kind of the rate at which species were formed over time. And this was especially interesting to us because when some other researchers had looked on the plant side of things, they found that some of these plants that form partnerships with ants, for instance, ones that make these things called extra floral nectaries, they're like little structures that are outside the flower that make nectar, and the ants will come along and sip the nectar from them, and some of them will actively defend that host plant. They were finding that plant groups that produce these extra floral nectaries actually were more diverse and had higher uh, rates of diversification. So they were forming species at a faster rate. And so this seemed like some sort of like beneficial or key in a beneficial type of key innovation, essentially. And we we're curious about what about if we look on the other side of things, if we look on the ant side of things, do, do ants utilizing plants in these different ways seem to have higher rates of diversification? And we found they didn't. What we see is that the situation is actually much more complex. And so what we think is going on is that there's been a lot of different shifts in diversification rates over time and across different groups of ants. And while this might be beneficial for some groups of ants at certain points in time, it might not always be beneficial throughout all of history and across all ant groups. So we, we think the situation is much more nuanced. So it was this kind of asymmetric sort of pattern where we were uh, on the plant side, people were seeing these benefits provided kind of at an organismal level seem to translate to some sort of like macroevolutionary benefits. But on the ant side, we weren't seeing that. That's another case where you're looking at the symbiosis from each player yields such a different insight like we were talking about with fungi and algae. Symbioses, I think, universally have an appeal to us. It sounds like very much like this this line of inquiry has much more fruit to bear in looking at the ant and plant relationship. So I did want to highlight it. Well, you know, uh, I'll wrap things up and this has been an absolutely information 
overloaded episode that I'm going to enjoy listening to many, many times. But to wrap this up, I will ask you the three questions that I like to ask all of my guests. And I have a feeling you'll have some insightful answers because you've been kind of blowing the lid off of things for me this entire interview. But what is a fungi that you love and why it doesn't have to be a lichenized fungi it doesn't have to be an edible fungi you know i noticed people can't see who are listening you have a cordyceps prominently displayed on your shirt uh so what is a fungi that you love and why great question and uh say give you the cop-out answer which is that it's hard to narrow it down but i guess i especially find uh a couple of groups really, really fascinating. So one is mycoparasites really kind of blow my mind. And I think they're kind of a really great opportunity and fun way to teach people about different ways fungi work and interact with other organisms. So for instance, when I'm doing like different outreach events, I'll sometimes have a hypomyces that's growing over a russula and then try to tell them that like, hey, this russula we're just seeing the fruiting body. The rest of this fungus is actually underground and forming a mycorrhizal association where it's helping a plant. So we've got this really complex set of interactions going on where we've got a mutualism being parasitized by a, another fungus. Or for instance, like a, a talipocladium growing on an elaphomyces that is mycorrhizal. So I, I think those are just really kind of fascinating to me. I also just find some of the fungi that attack invertebrates to be really wild, like Arthrobotrys going after nematodes in the soil. Septobasidium is another really wild one to me where it's growing over these scale insects. And I don't know if you've ever looked at the monograph from, from Couch, I believe it was from a long time ago, but there's some really rough pictures of these, uh, the Septobasidium growing into the scale insects, um, <laughs> forming all these coils. Um, and then, yeah, Ophiocordyceps is another one that's just really fascinating as well. So I, I think those are ones that especially blow my mind. And for me, that's the best answer when someone can give us multiple really interesting types of fungi to go and research. So thank you for that. And then a much bigger, broader question, but what has a relationship with fungi given to you? And that could be something it's taught you, maybe some kind of spiritual perspective or some greater understanding of ecology. But what has this relationship you've developed with fungi given to you? I think for me, it's it's been a way to really understand the interconnectedness of nature and see all the complex ways in which these different organisms benefit and hurt other different organisms. I think it's also um, been a really cool way to try to understand the, the evolution of symbioses more broadly, to kind of think about that in the context of fungi um, and a way to kind of more broadly understand biotic interactions. And I think it's also just really highlighted to me how cryptic and, and overlooked fungi in general are and that there's so much that we, you know, we might see a mushroom, but that's only the small bit of a fungus and there's a lot more going on out there in the world than we realize. So I think it's really kind of helped drive that point home that there's much more complex world out there. I think inevitably it does that. When you get into mycology or mushrooms, maybe you liked foraging or maybe you wanted to grow your own mushrooms, it pulls you into this world that's so much deeper and more complicated than you thought. And you, yeah, you start seeing the world in a different way. And just when you think you kind of have an understanding, you talk to someone like Matthew Nelson who uncovers lichens, and then you're just on this whole journey of like not knowing anything again and trying to understand. So yeah, there's just layers and layers of complexity to constantly uncover. Uh, and then another big, broad question kind of on the heels of that as we as a society develop a more intimate relationship with fungi, and I think everyone knows that's happening right now, we're not only from the culinary side, where now there's mushrooms in everything, medicinal mushrooms, you know, foraging has seen a huge increase in popularity as people want to forage for mushrooms. And now people are even understanding movies like Fantastic Fungi, Suzanne Samard's book, The Mother Tree, people are starting to understand mycorrhizal fungi. It's kind of out in everyone's consciousness how important fungi are right now. As that continues, what do you see or what's your highest aspiration for how we can take that relationship we're developing with fungi and use it to positively influence our, our cultures and societies? And I know that's a giant question to lay at your feet, but you know, if you look down the track in 20, maybe 50 years, how, how do you hope this influences society for the better? I hope that people really 
start to see that fungi aren't terrible, awful things. I guess I felt like I grew up and had this, I, I don't know where this feeling or thought came from, but kind of was under the impression fungi are bad. And I really like to try to educate people about how sure there might be some that will kill you, <laughs> but a lot of them won't. And a lot of them are just out there doing really important things for the world around us. And they're doing it in really complex ways and they have really fascinating lives of their own that if we just take some time to sit down and learn about them, just are kind of mind blowing in my opinion. And I think that is just a really cool way to kind of help illustrate to people that Oh yeah, fungi, it's just that, you know, that mushroom I get for pizza. No, they have a life of their own out there in nature. They're doing they're doing other things. And so I guess, yeah, I, I just I just find that an important part. And then also just helping them realize the magnitude of diversity, that it isn't just that mushroom on your pizza or the yeast, you know, that was used for this bread. There's a lot of species out there, you know. We know of like 120,000 species, but we also know that we don't know a lot. And when you start throwing numbers like well, there's estimates that there's a million species out there. That kind of blows people's mind, I think, and just kind of like illustrating that magnitude of diversity and placing it in perspective with things like mammals, where, you know, there might be 6,500 species of mammals. Fungi are just, you know, so much more diverse than some of these groups of organisms that get a lot of attention. So I think kind of it's a nice way to draw awareness to them as well transforming mycophobia, shedding light on the organisms that we don't always appreciate. I love how you just said that because we're sharing this planet with a vast, huge set kingdom of organisms that we're only just starting to understand the implications for how that will change our societies and our understandings of science and everything else. We can't even comprehend it right now as, as we discover more about these I, I like to say aliens living among us, these fungi living among us. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the show and being just really thoughtful with your answers, fielding my questions from every different direction. As I try to figure out these lichens, I've got this kind of private tutoring session with an amazing lichenologist. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your time with us. It's been fantastic to learn more with you. Thanks so much for having me. It's been, been a lot of fun and thanks for everything you do. I think this is a really great program and I really appreciate that you're bringing attention to fungi and covering really diverse groups of fungi and really uh, helping people to understand just how, how cool and important fungi really are. So thank you.